This is China, a country that once had the single largest B2B lending industry in the world. This is a nation that had around 4,000 to 6,000 B2B lending companies, and the total transaction value of China's B2B lending was at 327.8 billion US dollars per year at its peak. That's larger than the rest of the world's B2B industry combined. Some of these companies were worth billions and they were able to go public in the NYSE. But behind all those eye-popping numbers and flashy NYSE listings, today, out of those 4,000 companies, not a single one survived. The industry has entirely collapsed, with devastating consequences for the world's second largest economy. Especially for regular Joes like you and I that put in their life savings in these companies, only to lose all of it instantly. You see, P2P lending in China is as innovative as an industry could be. It created easy access to credit for 1.4 billion regular Chinese citizens who previously don't have any access to loans. And it also created an alternative investment opportunity in a nation where the people are not allowed to invest their money abroad. The P2P industry in China was not only big and profitable, but it also provided a reliable way for 1.4 billion Chinese citizens to fund their businesses and feed their families, or for workers to earn extra income and help fund their retirement. As business gurus say, great businesses solve problems. And China's P2P lending industry does solve a lot of economic and societal problems in China. Seeing the massive benefits that this industry provides, the Chinese government even supported the industry. FYI, that doesn't happen quite often. And they closely watched the P2P lending industry as it ballooned into the largest in the world. But over time, what they found was a problematic industry riddled with fraud and a business model that only works when you're intending on scamming people. The negatives far outweigh the positives. So, what happened? Well, today, we're going to explore one of the fastest, fraud-ridden, and most volatile collapses of an entire industry. Okay, so the first Chinese P2P lending platform was actually created way back in 2006, called CreditEase.cn. Now, this platform was created only a year after the world's first B2B platform was created in London called Zopa.com. So you can see that China adopted this new technology quite early. But China's P2P lending industry only started to gain real traction in 2013. And there are three main reasons why P2P lending became so successful in China. First of all, China is kind of a unique country in terms of technological development. Because most people there leapfrog older technologies such as fixed line phone and went straight into using mobile phones for financial transactions. And China is also a massive country with a high online penetration rate, aka the majority of the people use the internet. For example, in 2016, the peak years of China's P2P lending, China had 730 million internet users. That's more than the entire population of Europe. That also means that 53.2% of people in China use the internet. The Asian average rate was around 35% in 2016. You can really see this in China's obsession with e-commerce giants like Alibaba, which accounted for 40% of the world's e-commerce sales in 2016. The rise of e-commerce provided a basis for online lending platforms, including P2P lending to thrive and became a giant industry. The second reason for the rise of P2P lending is the lack of financial services in China. Now to be clear, China does have a lot of high-profile banks that loan out trillions of dollars each year. But they mostly serve state-owned companies or multinational corporations. Chinese banks don't really serve the regular Chinese people for both political and economic reasons. And this is true for both investors and lenders. Investors who look to invest their money to earn more money they don't have many options. They can't invest their money abroad because the government won't allow them, the Chinese stock market is known to be volatile and unreliable, and the bank deposit rate is only at 2 to 3%, which barely surpasses inflation. Bank deposit rate is strictly regulated by the government, so you can't get more than 2 to 3%. Compare this to P2P lending, which can get you a return of more than 10% each year and it became a no-brainer to put your money in these P2P companies, and for some people, they like to put all of it. 
For example, in this case study by the ACCA, 57% of B2B investors in China said that they like to bid for loans with returns of around 12 to 18%, which by the way, is fully guaranteed by the P2P platform, or so they say. Warren Buffett averaged 19.8% annual return throughout his investment career, so not bad at all. And for borrowers, it is hard to get a loan from banks as they prefer doing business with big companies. So again, for regular Chinese people who want to start a business or buy a car, they couldn't get loans. And even if they did get the loan, it will come with a very high interest rate as banks take full advantage of their monopoly status. This is despite the fact that small and medium-sized businesses account for 60% of China's entire GDP. Which is why P2P lending is so innovative and big in China. Suddenly, it's very easy to get loans to start a business or finance your consumption. In this case study again, 87% of P2P borrowers in China listed low borrowing threshold and easy auditing process as to why they chose to borrow from P2P platforms. And 57% of them also haven't borrowed money from banks or any kind of financial institutions before. Which tells you just how starved of credit the Chinese people were before fintech came along. And the third reason for the P2P success in China has to do with the government. They saw this new innovation that not only solved market inefficiencies and helped the middle to poor citizens of China, but also the government saw fintech and P2P lending as a driver for economic growth during a period of recession or slow growth, especially after the global financial crisis. So, they supported the fintech industry with as few regulations as possible. Literally, there was not a single law on P2P lending before 2015. And this was an industry that existed since 2006. This lack of regulation will turn out to be both a blessing and a curse at the same time. Okay, now we know why China's P2P lending industry was so successful and important. But how does it work? And why did they all fail? Well, first of all, Contrary to popular belief, P2P lending platforms are not defined as a financial institution, at least in purely legal terms. They are known as an information intermediary. What this means is that P2P lending companies are not supposed to take deposits like banks. Their jobs are to provide a platform for borrowers and investors to transact with each other, like a mobile app or a website and verify information regarding the qualification, authenticity, and legality of the borrower. You don't want to invest in a small cafe only for the owner to gamble all of your money, or that they're building the cafe at an illegal location. And it's the job of B2B lending companies to ensure that doesn't happen. You can compare this to an investment broker. They do not take deposits like banks, they just provide information regarding publicly listed companies and provide a platform for investors to invest their money in. And one defining feature of an information intermediary is, because they don't take deposits or pool funds, they don't take any risk if the borrowers default on their loans. Investment brokers don't care whether their clients profit or not from their investments. They just collect fees from every trade that people make. All the risks belong to the investors. This is how P2P lending companies work, or supposed to work. But in China, the way this works was entirely different. They did do all the things that I described before, but they also take in deposits and pool funds, plus providing principal guarantees. Unlike every other P2P platform that has a disclaimer telling that invest at your own risk, and if the business fails, you lose all your money, P2P companies in China claim that your principal is 100% guaranteed and you won't lose any money. Oftentimes, they even guarantee a return of 5-10% to per year, risk-free. There are loads of reasons why P2P lending in China is so different, but it's mainly due to regulation and competition. In the US and Europe, P2P lending companies are strictly information intermediaries, and that's the law. If P2P companies in the US started pulling funds and guaranteeing deposits, the executives will probably go to jail. In China, there's no law regarding this so P2P companies can do anything that they want. Competition also plays a huge role. If one company guarantees a return of 5% per year, there will be another company that pops out and guarantees a return of 10%. Then there's another company popping out that guarantees 12%. So. 
Because of competition, P2P companies in China have no choice but to offer unrealistic returns to attract investors. No one will invest with a company that guarantees a 3% return if there's another company that offers 12% return with no risk. Now hopefully, you can already see the major problems with the P2P business model in China. Because they take on deposits and pool funds, they behave exactly like banks, but they don't have rules regarding capital advocacy or reserve requirements that banks do have. So, they essentially became shadow banks, and this creates all sorts of complications. First of all, because P2P companies were not regulated at all, they were very vulnerable to volatile public sentiment. A simple bad rumor could easily cause a run on the platform as investors start withdrawing their money at the same time. It's very similar to a bank run. Second, because P2P companies don't have regulations regarding reserve requirements, they often don't have much capacity to withstand losses in the case that borrowers could not repay their debt. However, the worst consequence for this P2P business model is the absolutely maddening amount of scams and Ponzi schemes that could threaten the stability of a whole nation. You see, another reason why P2P companies in China started taking deposits instead of being an information intermediary is that it allows them to steal people's money. Under the information intermediary business model, the money that people invest is matched one-to-one -one with the borrower. Again, using investment brokers as an example, they don't take in people's money. When you buy a stock, the money simply goes to the seller of that particular stock, not the investment broker. And as for P2P lending in everywhere except China, the money from the investors goes directly to the borrower. But in China, as P2P companies pull in funds, they take people's money directly into their accounts first and then distribute it to the borrower as they see fit. Which means that P2P platform owners can just run away with the money, go overseas, and become overnight millionaires. Of course, at the expense of all the people that invested in the state platform. Normally, this kind of thing can be easily prevented with a simple regulation like put the money in a custodian bank rather than directly into the P2P company's pockets. But again, there's no regulation around this, so the platform owner can do whatever they want and run away with the money. And, of course, many did. Because of this, what seems like an innovative industry designed to help people out was actually just a race of who can attract the most people to scam. For example, this is an ad brochure for a Chinese P2P lending platform. Even if you don't understand Chinese, you can see that they offer 13.68 to 14.60% return per year, which is obviously unrealistic. And it's said below that the platform is guaranteed by the government. Spoiler alert, they don't. And you can even get a bonus if you tag along your family and friends to invest in the platform. Imagine this kind of ad put in on every major TV channel and billboards all over the country. Not to mention social media. Millions of Chinese people fell to these schemes and truly believe that they will not lose money because the platform offer principal guarantees. There are at least 4,000 platforms like these promising unrealistic returns and millions of unsuspecting investors putting most, if not all their money into the platform. So you can imagine how big of a scam this was. In December 2015, one of the largest B2B platform called Azubao unexpectedly ceased operations. Worried customers that cannot pull their money out of their accounts started complaining. And after a police investigation, it was found to be a Ponzi scheme. 95% of the listings on the website were fake and they were using new investors' money to pay older investors. And the absurd thing was, Azubao only operated for about a year and a half, but they managed to get 50 billion yuan or 7.6 billion US dollars out of their Ponzi scheme. Around 900,000 investors became the victim of Azubao, many of them small investors from rural areas who fell to Azubao's flashy TV advertising and unrealistic returns. For comparison, Evergrande, the largest property developer in China that got bankrupt years ago, had around 1.5 million victims. More than Azubao, sure, but remember that Azubao is just one platform. And there are around 4,000 other P2P platforms, albeit smaller. Now, this incident sparked the attention of the government. So after the incident, they began rolling out regulations to monitor P2P platforms so they don't scam people. 
but these scams and Ponzi schemes persist even three years later in 2018. Why? Well, the growth in the numbers of B2B platforms was so high that the government couldn't keep up as they don't have enough people to monitor all 4,000 companies. It was only in 2018 when the government finally have enough resources to effectively implement its regulations. For example, this is a list of some P2P platform collapses in China. At the top, there's Azubao which imploded in 2015, but many of these collapses actually happened in 2018, three years after the P2P industry was first regulated. Most of these platforms attract tens of thousands of investors, and the star symbol beside the platform name indicates that specific platform was convicted of financial fraud, in this case, almost all of them. From 2018 to 2019, more and more P2P companies seized their operations as the Chinese government stepped up to crack down the industry, especially after seeing the damaging consequences of letting these platforms run wild. The total unpaid loans from P2P platforms reach over 1 trillion yen, and high-profile P2P platform collapses happen every other week to the point that people lost all faith in anything labeled as P2P. And after a long downward spiral, in November 2020, the number of P2P companies in China has gone back to zero. The industry has entirely collapsed. Now in retrospect, the collapse of China's P2P lending isn't actually that bad. I said before that the total unpaid loans for all P2P lending companies reached 1 trillion yen, but the total loan from banks in China reached 120 trillion yen. The losses caused by the P2P lending industry isn't even 1% in size compared to the Chinese banking industry. The collapse has no real effect on China's economy, let alone the world. But what makes the Chinese P2P lending collapse so horrible is because the number of ordinary people that got involved in these scams. Unlike the P2P lending industry in the US, where 70% of the investors are institutional investors, with its advanced financial modeling and MBA analysts, the majority of Chinese P2P investors are regular people like you and I. Most of them didn't have any kind of financial education whatsoever. Many young people in China invest aggressively possibly to get rich quick and retire early, and they probably lost most of their hard-earned money. Retirees, who often don't have the financial knowledge needed to evaluate these investments, also put in their retirement money to these P2P platforms that offer much higher interest rate than a regular bank deposit. Many people lost their life savings, which they had intended to use to buy a house or pay for their kids' education or medical bills. It led to widespread protests of people demanding their money back across the entire country. And tragically, some even committed suicide as P2P lending companies flee the market without a trace. The collapse of the Chinese P2P industry didn't have much impact on the country's financial stability. But it does have a major impact on social stability. Which was why the Chinese government were so intent on cracking the industry down. This is Dover Hill, and see you next time.